Hey friends, welcome back to the Rubber Duck Recruiter. Tim Wilkins here. So I posted a video um, saying or asking you guys what you wanted to see more of, um, what you want to see more of on this channel. And a lot of you responded with a pretty extensive list of questions and just kind of ideas for videos. Now, a lot of ideas. It would take me like a year to film all of these different ideas that y'all asked for. So I figured why not just make a video um, answering them all and then if you're a recruiter and you stumble onto this video the odds are you're gonna find some question that enlightens you or makes you a little bit better and um, I actually don't really know what they all are so I'm gonna answer them on the fly here whoa it's totally real-world reality TV show here okay a day in the life of a technical recruiter field um, yeah so it depends on it's what is a day in the life is the question um, it just depends on um, whether or not you're at an agency or whether or not you're internal or whether or not you're at a top tech company like a Google or a Facebook or an Amazon or so on and so forth. If you're at an agency, then a, then a day in the life is just a lot of high volume calls and reach outs. If your bread and butter is LinkedIn and you're sending a lot of LinkedIn messages, if you're on boards like Dice or Monster or WorkSource or whatever, then you're probably cold calling people. You're probably, yeah, like I said, sending up a lot of emails and hopefully follow-up emails because most people respond on the third email actually. Um, and you're dialing for dollars and you're constantly making sure that you're staying in touch with candidates that you do have in process and you're pre-closing them all the time. You're doing the presumptive close, like, hey, you know, how did that interview go? So if they were to give you an offer around this area, would you be likely to accept at this moment, blah, blah, blah. So that's the agency. There's probably a lot more jokes. There's probably a lot less PC stuff going on. There's probably a lot more college kids around you. Um, if you're in an internal place and you're, you're, the majority of your day is focused on, you know, maintaining your relationships with hiring managers, making sure that you're, uh, getting the right kinds of profiles in for your specific company. You're focused on recruitment marketing, whatever that is for you. Um, you're focused on making sure that your ATS is relatively cleanly, depending on the size of your business. Um, and you're focused on making sure that you have a healthy funnel. You have stuff at the top of the funnel, middle of the funnel, and end of the funnel that is circulating that you can bring into the conversations as you guys talk about you know with the rest of your team and company where we're at with hiring and how certain positions are looking and there's probably a lot of time spent doing debriefs too you do a lot of the same stuff that agency agencies do um, but I would say that it's a little bit more focused on culture it's obviously focused on just one company and there's a little bit more variability um, in the types of functions that you're doing. At agencies, it's just like, I want to get candidates to get to like, like a one solid candidate can go to like many different companies that you're recruiting for. Um, at a, at, as an internal recruiter, you're kind of thinking, what's the best, the most important hires for this company at this time? And how can I get those wheels turning? And then once I have good momentum on that, let's look at these other ones and constant recalibration and improving processes, et cetera. And then if you're at a top, top tech company, it's a little bit of both, to be honest with you. You're constantly doing a lot of sourcing, unless you're specifically a recruiter, then you're constantly focused on closing. And, um, and yeah, you're always trying to evangelize the company. You're always trying to make processes better, um, especially depending on your level. If you're like an L3, then you're probably just sourcing. If you're an L4, you're expected to mentor. And if you're an L5, you're expected to like source, mentor, and improve processes. Okay, cool. Uh, number two, different ATS systems. How to use them? Best ones in your opinions, high-end ones. Um, you know what? This is a tough one because there's so many that come out every year, so I certainly can't speak to all of them, and it would be boring to try and figure all that out. ATS is, at the end of the day, you know, it comes down to, like, really small stuff. It's like, do you like watching Instagram Reels or TikTok? It's like, well, it's the same thing. You know, it's like short videos that are made to make you engaged. And that's kind of what ATSs are. They're just made to help you track your applicants. But I would say that, you know, you want to stick with ATSs that have um, good customer service, that have someone where you can actually reach out for help. You want to stick with ATSs that allow you to post to job boards as a part of 
um, as a part of some of the built-in features. You want to stick to ATSs that have follow-up emails because that will be a huge advantage over a lot of ATSs. And some of them that come to mind that are really good is Bullhorn is pretty good. Greenhouse is pretty good. Um, Crelate is a really affordable one, but it's really good. I like Crelate a lot. Um, what else? Um, gosh, I've used so many different ones. Um, I wouldn't. Uh, uh, I wouldn't encourage Newton. I wouldn't encourage. Um, what what the heck was a job? A job soy is okay if you're like a freelance recruiter. Um, yeah, there's just too many to go over. But the main things is just like how does it feel when you're using it? Um, does it makes does it feel good to you as you're looking at it? And doesn't have all the functionality that you need as a recruiter or a sourcer to. Um, automate as many processes as possible. Um, number three, more detailed info about the tech field, SDLC. Yeah, that's kind of a vague question. More detailed info about the tech field of the SDLC. I mean, the best way to learn about it is just to, to do it, just to recruit on as many roles as you can. Because the SDLC is just like, like I did, gave this metaphor recently to a construction worker who wanted to get into tech recruiting of, you know, here's how you can think about the SDLC in terms of building a house. Like all of the foundational aspects of a house are basically the middle to end of the SDLC. That's where the, the back end developers are like building out the foundation. And you can think of the paint of the house would be like, you know, front end developers. Front end developers make the look and feel of an application. Um, a software engineers make the functionality and the foundation of the application. And along the front, you'll see things like UX designers and, and graphic designers. And at the very, very end, you'll see release engineers. And maybe in the beginning and at the end, you'll see quality assurance, stuff like that. But yeah, um, if you want to learn more about it, I would say the best way. There's a guy named Geek Recruiters. Geek Recruiters? He gets really into the weeds on stuff. Um, I find it really boring to to learn like dry stuff. I like to learn by doing. So um, yeah, if this was a specific question, I could talk about it. But as far as the SDLC is concerned, just understand that basically speaking, if you want to release an app like Instagram or whatever your favorite app is on your phone, that there's going to be a back end, there's going to be a front end, there's going to be work done after it's released to improve upon it and make sure that it's working. Um, and then it continues to work and there's going to be work done on the front end even before that to make sure that uh, the way that it's going to work is all in place uh, and that the that, it, that all the tests that need to be tested before it is released is being done. And those are all falling on this software development life cycle. So hopefully that's helpful. Um, but yeah, the more you recruit for any especially at an agency, the more you'll kind of, it'll become like muscle memory or you'll just see variations of certain things and you'll kind of know what to do. Questions as an interviewer, you should ask the hire, you should ask to hire the best suitable candidates for your clients. Oh yeah, I mean, you can ask them what their superpower is at their job, I love that one. Like, what are you uniquely good at? You know, what do you bring to the table that no one else brings to the table at your job? And um, what else is a really good one? Um, you know, it depends on the position a lot of the time, the way that you ask certain questions. You know, as an engineer, the, the questions you're going to want to ask gonna be, are going to be a lot more focused on um, what they do in certain areas, in, in certain um, situations, like if they don't have leadership or if it's kind of unstructured or if somebody is having a disagreement on design, like how do they, you know, like make good and keep that relationship okay to suss out EQ and to suss out kind of level. And then, you know, for other positions, it's just kind of, it just depends. You know, people that are a little bit more softer skills, like a project manager, you know, you're gonna wanna ask them a little bit more behavioral and focus on that. And, um, and yeah, I think the reason that being a technical recruiter is kind of in demand is because true technical recruiters know how to get into the weeds and know how to ask true technical questions. So, um, so yeah, um, I don't feel like that was the best answer. Uh, should I ask to hire the best suitable candidate for your clients? Also, I mean, that depends on your client, right? Like a suitable question is going to depend on how well you've qualified your client and what they want. And, um, and yeah, like if it's, 
a client that works in payment systems, the best question might be like, tell me a time when you've worked on a payment integration service or something like that. I don't know. Um, yeah. All right, next one. Hiring managers, initial meeting preps. How do you know if they have realistic requirements? And what do you do if they don't? Oh, this is great. This is a great question. Um, a lot of hiring managers are going to be, they're, they're going to be kind of, I would say just very uneducated on the market and your job as a recruiter is to oftentimes educate hiring managers on what is and isn't reasonable. For example, I have a good example. My, my friend had uh, a client that he was working with and they had interviewed like all these, they had sent all of these folks and it had been two months. They're like, man, we haven't made one placement with this client. Why? And they ended up doing a call with the client to be like, what's going on? Why is this not working out? And the client's like, oh, well, you know, we hire one every, every one engineer every 90 applicants. And it's like, yo, that is not like, um, that is not a client that you would want to work with because that's not reasonable. I mean, the average software engineers on the, on the market for 20 days, the average role is open for 40. Like things move really, really quickly when talent is this in demand. So, um, so yeah, I would just kind of, as a recruiter, make sure you suss like, what does this person need to know? Where are their gaps in knowledge? And how can I use my emotional intelligence to educate them and to get on the same speed with them, get on the same pace with them? And that's going to, of course, come from time in the seat and come, you're going to get more confident as you do this job more. You'll just have more levity in what you say because you know you've seen it, like actually really not in theory. And, um, and yeah, uh, you'll just know what a realistic requirement is based on, um, it's really going to be based on like the fact that you've seen it, like it's not realistic to hire five software engineers you know, um, in one week or in one month, or, you know, it's not realistic to keep a software engineer waiting for three weeks, you know, if they're a top tier talent. It's not realistic to um, pay a senior software engineer 120,000 if they're really good. You know, you have to pay what the market is. And this is all stuff that hiring managers, generally speaking, they don't even really think about it. So that's where you come in. That's why you have a job. Writing a job description, keywords, etc. Again, you have to be more specific with this question. Um, yeah, I don't know what to say on this one. Like, what is what key? What is the job that you're trying to hire for? That's going to influence the keywords. I mean, what is this person trying to say here? Writing a job. Oh, how would I write a job description, keywords, etc. Um. Yeah, you know, I think that job descriptions are, they're interesting. It depends on what company you're at. Some companies, it's just like, like I know for a fact that at my company, I won't say what that is, but like job descriptions oftentimes don't even match what we're recruiting for. It's just a place for people to apply, you know? And then if you go to a startup, it's like the job description is extremely important because they want to say everything um, and they really need to get their point across in the job description. So. I would say that you're probably talking about somewhere where the job description actually matters. And yeah, it's just tough with the limited information because again, you're gonna to wanna to tailor it to the job that you have, the company that you have. The keywords are gonna come from the type of roles you're hiring for. Um, so, I mean, the best things that I could say is make it inclusive. Make sure you have a strong voice that is matched up with your company. Don't have it be too dry. Um, and uh, yeah, try and make it unique in some way. Um, but mostly just make sure it lines up with the brand of your company. That's probably the most important thing because at the end of the day, you're gonna be like, it's pretty easy to write job descriptions. Like, hey, are you a good engineer? We would like you to work here. That's the job description, you know. Please have senior experience and open source languages unless I am Microsoft, in which case, C sharp is a closed source or is a proprietary language, whatever. Um, okay, I'm getting tired, but we're gonna keep bulldozing through this. Which one is more important for your candidate to answer? Behavioral questions, situational questions, or be good in technical details? Again, it depends on um, the position, but I would say that on a pre-screen, you don't need to get too deep into the 
technical weeds. That's not really your job. Your job is to assess a general technical impression. So obviously you're not gonna out tech your engineer, otherwise you'd be an engineer. So the main thing that I would say is you wanna just kind of suss out for how they specifically use technologies, if they can point to specific instances where they answered the question that the job description is asking. I would also say that <clears throat> that uh, in terms of behavioral questions, you know, um, it's it's good to to ask one behavioral question, I guess. So you could say, you know, name a time when you had a disagreement with a hiring manager or an engineer or just somebody about how to proceed forward and how you problem solve and troubleshoot at that. That's always a good one. Um, but I would say overall, you know, like you're getting a feel for who they are, you know, and you're also, it's kind of like, you'll notice that after a certain amount of time, you'll just kind of know, like very quickly, like what level this person is at. It's just in how they present themselves and how they talk about the projects that they did, whether or not they've led projects, you know, like that's always a good one. Like, you know, have you ever led a project end to end? Tell me about that. That's a great one. Um, but there's not one that's necessarily more important. They're all important because the first initial screen is a cursory understanding of who they are, their motivations. It's just so much to encapsulate in 30 minutes that you can only possibly kind of get an overview of all these things. Because you have to you have to make sure they're qualified quickly and then you have to sell them on the role. You know, and that doesn't matter if you're agency or internal, you're still gonna have to do that. So yeah. Um how do you know if your candidate is bullshitting you or not? Excuse my language. What to look for in their answers? I made a video answering this question, how to know if a candidate is bullshitting you, because I really like that question. <coughs> so watch that video. Um, data analysis, how to do it, LinkedIn insights. Hmm, I don't know. I mean, I do, but that's, that's, there's so much to that question. Maybe that's worth making a video on. I'm gonna skip that one for now, though. That's gonna be too long of a answer. How to make your resume stand out as much as a tech recruiter? Well, obviously getting, if you can get a contract at Google or Amazon or Facebook or whatever, and they give them out like candy if you have a year or more of experience, then that is going to do wonders for your earning capacity and your ability to get jobs in the future. So that's a big one. You know, that's how you can make your, your resume stand out. Um, I mean, the truth about resumes for, for, the majority of people is they don't matter as much as you think they do. I would say your LinkedIn is even more important than your resume at this point, but um, people look at your resume for like five seconds. They just look, have they, how long have they worked at this job and have they vaguely done what we want them to do? Which with recruiters, it's always kind of the same stuff. It's closing candidates, having a good idea of metrics, having a good idea of sourcing and talent mapping and yeah, and how many placements you average on a month and how many requisitions you can handle um, at once. It's kind of all of the things that they're gonna look for. And um, what else? Is there anything else I would say? How to make your, yeah, I mean, you make your resume stand out too by just calling out, um, I don't know how to describe it other than, I can give a good answer to this, a little bit more of a good answer to this. Good resumes are specific. They go into specific metrics. They go into good good resumes know what recruiters are looking for in recruiters. I know that sounds kind of weird, but as you become a better recruiter and, and stay in this industry longer, you'll start to know like, all right, I tend to have 15 pre-screens on average per week. That means that I have 60 pre-screens on average per month. That tends to lead to maybe three initial interviews per week, which is roughly 15 initial, or 12 initial interviews per month. And of those 12 initial interviews, I usually get half of those on site. So that's six people. And of those six, roughly two get an offer. You know, like if you can illustrate that in your resume, those metrics, um, then it's going to be a lot more apparent that you know what you're doing. So um, yeah. I guess that's probably good enough for that. Um, what candidate experience? Oh, let's see here. 
Mistakes to avoid during your technical recruiting process. This will be the last one I answer. I love this question. Um, mistakes to avoid. Oh, my dog's asleep and she's making hilarious noises. Hold on, I'll show you this. <laughs> sleeping at 10, 10 09 a.m. I love it. Um, mistakes to avoid. I would say. Um, Avoid jumping in too fast before you do a little bit of talent mapping and understanding of the role. Um, a lot of people will just kind of jump in and you do yourself a massive service by just doing a little bit of research and intel before you start something. You can It can narrow your search. You can end up like stopping yourself from starting in the wrong direction in your search and like doubling down on that without when just a little bit of, um, when a little bit of pre- uh, sorry, this is my girlfriend. Um, babe, let me call you right back. I'm in the middle of a video. I'll call you right back. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. If, if you do a little bit of kind of, whether it's talking to a hiring manager or just kind of looking it up on the internet or thinking about where they might be coming from, what companies, just a little bit of talent mapping will save you from so much headache. Um, I would say that that's a really big mistake that people make. They just jump in and they go too broad and they end up finding quasi, quasi qualified candidates that just don't make it and you waste months and months of time. Um, what's another mistake people make? Um, yeah, you don't do follow up emails. You just send one email and say it's game over. It's like, nah, like do follow up emails 100%. Like, it's okay to be a little annoying, you know, because at the end of the day, you might get this person a great job. So just annoy them. It's kind of like dating. It's like, shoot your shot, man. You know, wait till they say no, but just keep going for it. Um, okay, well, that's probably enough questions for now. Um, hope that was helpful. Uh, like, comment, subscribe, or don't. I don't mind. I usually don't ask to do that, so... Um, comments are always fun though because it makes me want to make more videos when you guys interact with me so all right may the recruiting odds be ever in your favor peace calvin and Hobbs.